India's IT hub Bengaluru has been in the news headlines because of a viciously politicized alleged racket where hospital beds are sold at a premium to covid patients they just be surya a young upstart member of parliament representing the Bengaluru South constituency for the Bharatiya Janata Party has muddied the waters by seemingly deliberately singling out 17 Muslim personnel working at the Bangalore Municipal Corporation's control room as being part of the racket. As it turned out, only one of those 16 could be facing some charges while the rest were clubbed together for nothing more than political brinkmanship. Mayank Shah Report spoke to the well-known Bengaluru-based journalist, columnist and anchor Vasanthi Hari Prakash to get a perspective on not just the so-called bed for cash scandal but dwell on broader issues including whether the country's IT hub is putting its skills to use in data crunching at a time when there has been a woeful absence of credible numbers about the pandemic. Vasanthi Hari Prakash. Vasanthi Hari Prakash, welcome to my entire reports. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Mayank. Uh, absolutely same sentiment. Uh, I, I really look forward to this conversation with you because it will also, I think, help me become more clear about what one's own country is doing uh, with regard to the pandemic. So I, I'm absolutely happy to be on your show. Thank you. Uh, I was reading some... Uh, latest figures about Karnataka. Uh, the tracker says that there are about a little over 2 million cases in the state of nearly half of which, to be precise, about 983,000 in Bengaluru area, yeah. urban Bengaluru area. Now that's a significant percentage to have out of, out of one state in a single city. But on the other hand, uh, the tracker also suggests that uh, over 600,000 have recovered and some 360 or thousand are still active cases and mm -hmm. about 8,000 or so deaths. Uh, broadly, it does not look as bad as it seems in India, but uh, what is your sense sitting in the city? Well, one would like to, let's say, be optimistic um, and I think the best way to gauge those or, or, or a, a kind of way to say whether we are doing any better than we were doing, let's say, the past few weeks is to match the number of uh, new active cases with the number of uh, healed or, or uh, you know, recovered cases. So I think that's a very straight metric. But I'm telling you, apart from all the statistics that you have mentioned, um, on the ground, one doesn't get a sense, uh, I'm afraid, of, of things improving to the extent that it ought to. Let me give you an example, Mayan. To, today, I, I begin the show with, a, with, a, with real sadness in my heart. Some people may even have seen on my social media that we, uh, I personally lost a very dear friend uh, who was an extraordinary person working for senior citizens. Uh, she, she ran an old age home in, in the uh, south of Bangalore. Uh, she was 61 years old. She was so full of life. I don't want to mention her name at this moment simply because, you know, I, uh, it's, it's very hard for me to, to even imagine that she, she died waiting for an ICU bed that she could have been saved if at all she had got to the hospital on time. It, her SpO2, the, the oxygen saturation level, had dropped down to 35 and there was a day-long search uh, for her for, for her hospital uh, bed. And she passed away this morning and one can't help but think that there are so many, just so many across India that, that we see every day. I don't think we have seen obituaries in a single day, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, happened this season in our country as much as must, must have taken for us years on, on, on social media, you see. Uh, so what does this say? I mean, I don't, I would love to go by this um, thing that, okay, I think the, the so-called curve is getting flat in the fact that, okay, people are working towards, but ultimately, if you, uh, at the bottom line, it is a decades and decades of negligence of healthcare in this country has has kind of come home to roost and we are we are we are paying the price 
Um, and so even if the, the numbers show this or that, frankly, at, at this moment, I'm, I'm way much in despair over what we have seen um, across India. I think it will take even a diehard optimist like me to, to actually feel better about those numbers. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry about your personal loss. I'm, I know it cuts too close to your heart. And uh, please accept my condolences on that. Uh, you know, I, I've been reading up a great deal about uh, one particular era of uh, India and, and the world, in fact. Uh, I'm talking about 1918, 1999. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that's the era I'm talking about, about 103 years ago, uh, when the Spanish flu pandemic hit across the world. And India was, uh, people don't realize now, was absolutely laid waste by that pandemic. About 18 million Indians died. Yeah. And uh, uh, Gandhi Ashram was uh, in the grip of it, including Mohandas Gandhi himself. I don't think people have the concept of the death that the Spanish flu caused. Right. And if you look at it over the last century, we have paid this huge price without really, as you mentioned, uh, 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 addressing the problem of our rather ramshackle health system. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you personally believe as a journalist and someone who is in the thick of it, that this would stir up not just this government, but any that follows into focusing on public health infrastructure? Um, I would like to think uh, there are, pockets of bureaucracy uh, which are which are even now in india showing such promise we we have two instances in maharashtra our, our neighboring state both in nandurbar and uh, someone like in mumbai uh, who is at the moment i would call him a, a superstar and rightly so uh, iqbal singh chahal the uh, commissioner of the Bum mumbai municipal uh, bombay municipal corporation bmc who has shown a what is beginning to be called as the Mumbai model, uh, which is to, um, uh, you know, quote, quote his, in his own words, creating many, many Mumbais within the big metropolis that we have. Uh, what he essentially did was to actually uh, sort of demolish this central war room, which seems to be the strategy uh, that, that uh, Indian cities have uh, taken to tackle the, the, the kind of uh, you know, enormous numbers of, of COVID cases that, that have been uh, coming and in, in, in a more virulent strain uh, this season, Mayan. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't know if really governments learn from mistakes because historically there's been no evidence for, for them to uh, uh, learn from, from that and one would really uh, love for this to happen. But what I can say is that uh, the, the aspects that give me hope are people like Mr. Chahel, um, or like the uh, Nandurbar collector, um, I, I can't recall his name, but, but you know, who used the lull in the COVID uh, wave between 2020 and 21 to set their house in order to make sure that they have in-house oxygen uh, generating plants. Uh, to, and then in Nandurbar, for instance, there's a concept of something called the nun oxygen nurse who's, who's only... Uh, job profile is to make sure that whoever comes uh, and lands up in these primary health centers with, with COVID symptoms are periodically checked for their uh, oxygen saturation, for their uh, you know temperature, or for any other signs of breathlessness. So there is a very primary level of care, which itself is going to act as um, uh, you know, a deterrent for, for a patient's condition before it really gets worse to the, to the stage that he or she may need the ventilator. But frankly, with governments, one is not very sure. You're sitting in the so-called uh, technological hub of the country. Uh, how do you think Bengaluru has deployed or has it deployed its uh, strengths as a tech uh, capital of the country to take on this pandemic at all? I, I don't see much evidence of that, maybe in terms of data collection and data analysis they have done it but uh, what's your sense uh, since you live there uh, as we speak i think this is uh, about two to three days since an entire huge controversy died down or if, if at all it is still died but uh, 
it what we can call the bed scam or the bed allocation scam so essentially bangalore 2 has followed the central uh, war room uh, strategy put together by the brihad bengaluru mahanagara palike the bbmp which is a municipal corporation um and it there came a time when it clearly could not handle the number of uh, cases with with the available number of uh, beds across uh, uh, bangalore city now um at at such point of time the member of parliament uh, in Beng of bengaluru south uh, tejasvi surya uh, he claimed he said that he had done a sting operation in expose uh, of of uh, a scam that that was unfolding in this uh, control room so of course uh, one needs to mention that he also belongs to the bhartiya janata party as much as the ruling uh, party here in karnataka um however his his contention was that the system was being rigged uh, just so that you know there uh, uh, it it made use of a of a certain loophole in the technology of the system where at at the point uh, you know a, when you can book a bed in the name of someone who has tested covid positive however the um, the distinction that is not made in the system is of a covid positive patient who does not have the symptoms and therefore does not require the bed in the first place so let's say there is this person a who uh, who uh, in the system generated by bbmp is coming up as as uh, covid positive then uh, it is possible for certain this is what the member of parliament claimed uh, that it is possible for a group of people a set of people who were uh, ensuring that there were these bogus names or bookings made in names of those who did not need the bed but the system recognized them as covid positive so it it allowed that booking to happen and so when that booking happened so it would it would block uh, the bed for the a it would block the bed for somebody who actually needs it who has all the symptoms and is probably getting getting worse but also because the turnaround time of the uh, time that uh, that a bed um, uh, you know uh, a patient once uh, she occupies the bed will need that for let's say a week or so so it allows those people who are rigging the system to reach out offline because they had access to those numbers uh to reach out offline to those people who genuinely needed the beds and negotiate with them uh and fleece them charge them to get them a bed which they would otherwise have got as part of the system right so uh therefore what's the kind of uh, uh technology at work here i am no i am no tech expert and in fact i would probably be able to answer this question uh better in a couple of days or more days because there is a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of participation uh, that that is uh, that is actually expected um so yes the the there have been people who uh, uh, you know who have advocated i mean there are citizen groups in bangalore who have said that you you have to allow open sourcing there's also uh, tejasvi surya who uh, met mr nandan nilekani the the technocrat and uh, you know a, a former infosys uh, person as we know so there was there is talk of greater technology to be um, let's say used uh, in, in to be deployed if, if that's the word a, a better technology a better system that that uh, does not allow this kind of scamming or rigging the system and and you know kind of allots these bets but uh, frankly that seems to be taking time and that's an irony that the you know it city of bangalore should should uh, go through uh, something like this at all in the first place uh, i'm glad you gave me a segue to uh, the member of parliament uh, uh, tejasvi surya uh, i am looking at it somewhat differently that even with that kind of technological excellence uh, the city as well as the rest of the country continues to to be devoured by uh, rather disturbing uh, politicking that you see even in the midst of that uh, he was stuttering and stammering during a news conference uh, when he was asked about why he chose to focus on specific names who happened to be all muslims yes. uh, six, 17 of them to be precise uh, yes. who, who were alleged to be involved in the scam that you're talking about and it turned out that was probably not the case except in one particular uh, instance 
Yes. Um, I, I, I don't want to drag this down to uh, the politics of it, but uh, I think it is also symptomatic of a different kind of virus that grips India right now. I mean, it, is a, it is a far dangerous virus, uh, uh, Mayank, and I think the whole of last year, or at least before the pandemic set in, we have we have seen the the route that uh, down uh, India went with the, with the you know with the NRC. Uh, with the issue of citizenship and it, it threatened to really tear apart the secular fabric of, of India. Um, that is a separate topic. It has its merits and demerits, but to just bring it back to what Bangalore has gone through in this uh, one week is a sort of disgust for the political leadership, which rather than focus on the issue at hand, which in this case was a dire need to set the set a system in place where nobody, no citizen has to die for mm -hmm. want of a simple hospital mm -hmm. bed, an ICU bed. As an elected representative, one would imagine that this was what a focus ought to be. And right. even if really, if really it was it was a scam, as as uh, it, it uh, you know in all likelihood it is, it need not have taken the communal color that uh, you know Mr. Surya and and his uh, team gave. More and more reports are emerging in the regional media as to how this was, in fact, a cover up for another legislator from the ruling party whose name was anyway, um, you know, beginning to be discovered in this, uh, in this whole scandal. And to cover that up, um, Surya chose to focus on these 17 names uh, at one point of time when he entered the control room. It, it uh, apparently was the, the people who were seated in, in that uh, room were were Muslims, but to suggest that um, uh, it were you know if any corruption had happened, it was only these uh, this set of names is absolutely um, nothing else but but hate mongering at a time when when actually uh, we need solutions, not 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 this kind of a poison. Uh, luckily though, luckily a lot of lot of people. I mean there was a lot of pushback against uh, that move by the uh, member of parliament. Um, alas, there's also a lot of, uh, let's say, sanction, uh, as people would argue that there were certain uh, pockets of people who bought that whole line. And, uh, but, you know, b before we knew it, there were actually uh, WhatsApp forwards, uh, which which uh, began targeting, uh, let's say, in this case, the Muslim group. Uh, however, I think uh, Bangalore really stood as one, I would like to believe, because there was, I mean, all of us kind of, uh, pulled out all stops to call out the, an absolute utter nonsense that, that was happening in the name of, um, you know, exposing or or, uh, or sting operation. So much so that uh, uh, Mr. Surya himself had to uh, come back and apologize in the in the control room. He also held a press conference, which you which you of course uh, mentioned. Some would say it is half-hearted, but in my case, it's I would see it as a victory of those citizens. Who really put their foot down? All of us um, uh, together who said that this is so not on. This is not acceptable. And pandemic, in any case, it's not differentiating between a Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim. And I think uh, I hope there are at least some lessons that uh, the young leader has learned uh, uh, to actually not uh, go down that route ever. But that's that's at the moment a wish. Yeah, but the sheer fact that he had the gumption in the midst of it all to uh, be so egregiously and narrowly focused on a particular community to make a rather uh, a volatile political point. It speaks to the way things are, don't they? Of course they do. You see, I just returned from um, a state in India's east, which, uh, which went to the polls. Um, and uh, I think the most vicious political campaign even amongst the not so polite political campaigns that we are used to, uh, happened in uh, West Bengal. And I am not laying the blame only at the door of uh, BJP, but uh, even at TMC. Uh, so uh, I, I, it's, there's, there seems to be a certain um, agreement amongst political parties of all hues that this is now acceptable. Uh, and therefore, we have seen um, vitriolic uh, sort of, uh, you know, remarks uh, and and oh, I mean whether you call it appeasement or whether you call it uh, uh, appealing to a certain but at the same time things have gotten so communal so casty so narrow-minded that you would really think we are, we are back some four three four centuries um, I did sense a, a, a sort of uh, you know fatigue amongst voters 
at this uh, narrative, but the fact that politicians get away with it um, says it uh, seems to kind of you know prove uh, that politicians are not improving uh, in a hurry. This this is there, there to stay. It's not it's not getting sanitized. I mean, as much as the sanitizer is is, is so much the buzzword, um, but this is not uh, this virus is not going away. Yeah, but the politicians come from the same stock, don't they? as ordinary people. And there is a great deal of tolerance and even indulgence for this kind of thinking. I, if, if there is any anecdotal evidence one can uh, draw from on social media spouting nonsense that goes on, it's clear yeah. that people have uh, patience for this kind of uh, rather toxic and vicious politicking in India. I, I agree with you. I think uh, the decent people who I would like to believe uh, are, are in a majority because, you know, when when let's say, I mean, mine was a sort of a road trip uh, uh, solo in that state. And I'm just uh, telling you from the point of view of someone who really was on the ground in rural Bengal. And, and you know, most of these places, when you are meeting people one on one, uh, the, 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 the language or the tone or the warmth or, or the decency or the public values are so much intact uh, that one wonders what kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of worm gets into the head the moment you wear a sort of a, a political crown. I also see the common people, the, the mainstream, expressing disgust at the sort of language that is used, whether it's a prime minister who was calling out, you know, Didi or Didi in, in the tone that he did to an elected representative like the, like the chief minister, uh, the lady, uh, Mamta Banji. But then again, uh, uh, you know, in Hindi, as we'll say, wo koi dood ki dhuli nahi hai, because she has also used similar uh, offensive language, except that when it is uh, deployed against a lady, it comes off looking so much more worse. Point being that uh, each one is is in such, um, uh, you know, it's it's really the, the lowest level benchmark. But for to your point of people, after all, coming from the same stock, I don't know where, where this, this mutant strain okay. Uh, emerges in in uh, speak. How is it as a journalist to work in in, in the time of a pandemic of this scale? Uh, what kind of challenges uh, journalists of independent mindset like you face? First and foremost challenge is that uh, there is no single policy across states in India that considers journalists as frontline workers. Um, Punjab, I was told, uh, journalist, I mean, I'm talking about mid-March when, when really there, were, there hadn't been any such, any spike in such as what we see now. And some of us were getting ready to report for elections and we knew that this, is, this means that we are really literally going into the dust and din and of the of ground zero of, of our states, whether it was Tamil Nadu or, or Kerala or, or Bengal or Assam, uh, we were really struggling to, to get the vaccine. Now, um, I personally speaking, um, somebody said, what's so difficult for a journalist to get a vaccine? Come on, like as if you guys can't uh, do this. Can't you use your cloud? But the influence like it, why can't you? I said, yeah, it's, of course, it's the easiest thing. I can probably walk into some hospital in Bangalore, flaunt my probably press ID card. But without that provision being made in the system, which was considering or which was allowing only citizens above 60 years of age or younger, but you had to have comorbidities, then the system will take I mean, you know, uh, anyone under 60 as assuming that I have comorbidities, uh, which th therefore meant that uh, I would maybe I would get the vaccine. But chances are that in the central or God knows whichever, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, place my, my data and, and uh, um, details uh, would be fed to, it would assume that I, let's say, for instance, I'm hypertensive or that I have diabetes. Which, which will certainly create problems uh, later for, for journalists for, let's say, when they have to claim their own insurance or, or uh, you know, reapply. And why would anyway one have to, the, the very fact that you have to kind of have this backdoor approach to get something as simple as a vaccine, right. given that you're not sitting at home, but you actually had proof that you were traveling to a place. 
that was really disappointing to this day uh, in fact mayank one of the networks of women journalists that i am a part of it's called the nwmi the network of women in media india we compiled a list of journalists and it's it's obviously an uh, you know and being updated list of work in progress of the number of journalists who have lost their lives and i would like to quote from the data and the report uh, actually says that 235 journalists this far uh, and this report is as of 10th of may 2021 losing their life to corona complications in uh, you know in this year since the pandemic hit in 2020 and most of them were based in telangana andhra pradesh uttar pradesh maharashtra madhya pradesh and odisha and in fact more data which suggests that those journalists who have died uh, uh, most of them have been in their mid 40s and it's uh, we are of course uh, updating this regularly but also that you know when we put out a memorial uh, to actually say that you know we we really express grief over the loss of of these journalists we also wanted media houses to be more responsible in taking up uh, safety issues of their own journalists at the workplace to to provide them with uh, adequate protection whether it's in terms of masks the n95 masks the surgical masks also you know in terms of uh, uh, safe transportation when they are getting to their place of uh, work but also insurance facilities i'm sure people who are watching your show will know that as it were there have been such heavy job losses in the media as much as let's say uh, across so many sectors but i think media has been particularly aggrieved during this wave of the pandemic because who is to tell those stories of lives being lost we we've, we've seen relentless images coming at us of of uh, bodies being cremated in uh, new delhi uh, cities like uh, bangalore uh, literally gasping for breath and this is happening across the country in rajasthan in U- uttar pradesh and so who uh, who has to tell the story this is not something that can happen on zoom calls it, it has to happen when the journalist goes on ground right. uh, but when the journalist does go uh, she and he are going without adequate protection to themselves which is why you have a loss of these 235 lives which which was needless speaking about my experience um, you know it was so difficult to get what one would have thought is a very very basic protection which is a vaccine to go out there um, and ultimately i did not get it so i i literally did all my election travel without having the vaccine uh, on the 1st of april it did open for for those uh, above 45 Uh, but at the same time uh, i was starting for bengal that very day and there was this apprehension that should i take it at such short notice the side effects will stop me from from right. being uh, you know uh, on on the job uh, for uh, reporting so i think journalists also sometimes tend to think that you know story comes first and they they put safety uh, pretty much um, on on the uh, back burner and which is why it's cost journalism very very dearly this season right. uh to continue a bit on uh, on the theme uh this has been an absolutely i mean we all recognize this to be an unprecedented uh, event for india except if you look at the 1918 spanish flu pandemic but it's too far back in history for most people do you think this in any way significantly changing the direction in which uh, journalism has been so far uh, the journey journalism of todayism as i call it uh, people are just basically sucking up to the powers that be by and large for any number of reasons uh, it's not for me to judge sitting here uh, do you think this has really opened uh, uh, the eyes of the profession now that we are really we witness bodies floating in the ganga I yeah. read only this morning there were a few dozens floating uh, in the Ganga and elsewhere perhaps. So, do you, as a journalist, believe that this could significantly change uh, the way the media has operated in the last say ten years? I would uh, think that the uh, you know the media, despite everything that that uh, let's say the non-media uh, set. may be thinking that okay you know there's so much of sensation there's so much of bias there is either you know pro left wing pro right wing but despite all that um, uh, the media has been vibrant in playing its role i mean no matter which position it took and particularly i would say the role of independent journalists who otherwise are loosely called as freelancers 
has really come because some of the outstanding work in the past few years, uh, at least past couple of years, has 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 come from smaller media. The, the, for instance, let's say Neetu Singh of Gaon Connection, who who won the Chameli Devi Jain uh, Award, who was putting out stories from from you no know, rural Uttar Pradesh, uh, which which uh, no big media would would probably you know touch with a barge pole. Likewise, you know, in the south we have uh, enough examples. So I think in terms of the media, I would think uh, of it not really as this one single characteristic media, but but so many different, uh, uh, you know, this thing. So there have been big media who have disappointed uh, uh, its uh, viewers and readers. But at the same time, there are those who are really trying to uh, keep this alive. Uh, speaking about the pandemic and whether this, this takes a different role, yes, I, I feel it does. Because um, one is that the raw and real, you know, like like sometimes we, we use these words to just convey that, okay, we are doing something. But frankly that this is the raw and real that that, that we have got um when there were images of the western media for instance uh, relentlessly flashing um images of these burning uh, bodies uh, there were some who argued that uh, well the truth you have to uh, you know hold the torch to truth and and uh, this is what it was uh, whereas of course there, there was another view they're saying that okay uh, that the western media has not um, you know applied the same uh, spotlight and torch to their own uh, backyards when, when say, the New York, city of New York or, or people in Europe and, and uh, uh, let's say, the United States were also, you know, witnessing similar deaths. And uh, uh, neither did the Indian media cover that in its sort of gruesome manner, nor did they themselves, um, you know, kind of this thing. Whereas here, there was no question of privacy for those, uh, let's say, the poor who had lost their this thing they, when they were grieving. So there have been lots of ethical questions uh, as well. I was personally very disturbed by some of the um, reportage uh, that by, by let's say, focusing on, on the cremations after a certain point, it, it just began to feel that this is this is some sort of a voyeurism in, in terms of this thing. You've made your point. Now you really need to move on to some of the deeper things, which is that why did healthcare in India really get to this stage uh, you know, 70 plus years uh, after independence. So, so there is no, so much of the media has also did take the very obvious shocker route of showing the dead and stopping the story there without really going into um, statistics and deeper journalism. So I feel that with the critique that's coming out, like I remember yesterday and the day before, Brahma Chalani has, has also written about uh, what what this kind of uh, uh, coverage actually does. There have been mental health experts who are saying that, okay, please, I mean, the media now seems to be responsible. It's, you, you can't go on and on uh, with the same sort of uh, shocking images for weeks together. You made your point, but this is what is having its effect. So net result of it, I hope, will be a sort of an introspection as well, saying that let's not get carried away by the extent of... Uh, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, helplessness that, of course, uh, uh, India, I mean, it has, there are, there are no two questions that the ruling party, uh, Mr. Modi and his government have to have to take the blame rather than really uh, trying to not, uh, you know, we, we have not even seen a press conference even now. I mean, one would have thought that this would be, this would be that apocalyptic moment when probably things would so drastically change. But that clearly wasn't uh, happening. So the, the same old game of center blaming the state, the state uh, blaming the center, um, politicking such as such as what we saw in Bangalore, taking on, uh, you know, um, uh, an anti-Muslim bias. So the more we think things should change, the more they have remained the same. And so even in media, um, I would not see this as such a, you know, watershed uh, moment. But certainly, some introspection is, is bound to come out of it, saying that, okay, so, so what do we do differently from here on? Just last couple of points. One is, of course, in the interest of accuracy. Early on, uh, within the US, where I live, there were fairly graphic reporting of uh, bodies being come, shifted out of uh, various New York hospitals. There were mass scale uh, burials that were shown and photographed. Uh, uh, I think it's... Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's an unfortunate reality of uh, the media that uh, a burning pile looks far more striking than uh, a burial, and it's it's, yeah. it's macabre in some sense. But 
journalists and even readership and viewership does get drawn to what is macabre rather than just a humdrum uh, burial that's going on. So that's that's one point I just wanted to yeah. put it yeah, out there. Yeah, but yeah, to, yeah. to conclude, uh, I'm particularly interested in whether uh, this has stirred up Silicon Valley of India, as it's called, Bengaluru, uh, to look at health from a purely technological standpoint to create systems which would allow far better distribution, far better tracking, far better predicting uh, predictive models of what might happen uh, in the coming days and weeks and years. Do you, do you get that sense or you think it's too early in the midst of the pandemic for companies to think along those lines? Um, see, even as you're asking me, I uh, think that this is the right uh, segue for me to, to speak on the other hand, what's been the, let's say the pluses uh, that, that that have come from this, which is that, you know, citizens, ordinary citizens, citizen groups, organizations, who have really helped uh, each other. And as usual, when you know, with, uh, even in my election travel, in fact, one man in Jiaganj in Murshidabad district of Bengal, when I asked him, "Ki sarkar, ye sarkar apke liye kuch karti hai? Ki acha agli party, wo, who do you want the next party to be in power?" And you know, is the current government, is the, rule, uh, is the TMC, the Trinamool Congress, doing anything good for you? So he almost looked as if, why are you even asking me this question? That he said, well, Sarkar kabhi madad karti hai kya? And it was almost like, you really, and it was so, it was said with so much of a matter of factness that it's almost a default settings that, hey, listen, we have led our lives despite the government. Right. What are you talking about? So he, you know, it really stayed with me that he was a bowel singer. And, you know, uh, when he said, he said, Log hai na. he said that there are people who are there to help each other. What, what's the point of a government? Right. So for years and decades, this sort of absence of governance and misgovernance together have created a system uh, in, in our country that, that the results are, are there for us to see now. However, what is heartening, which is what I was beginning to tell you, uh, is the, uh, you know, the, the, let's say, initiatives. Like just before I came into your interview, Mayank, there was this group of women of IIM, the, the prestigious Indian Institutes of Management, um, who uh, have created a sort of a dashboard of resources uh, to identify a, a vacant ICU bed uh, anywhere in the country, of course, it's city-wise uh, data. I'm I'm putting out a disclaimer. It, it was I, something I just saw and I just clicked and I didn't have enough time to try that out. Right. But I know that in the past few days, each one of us, I'm sure even you outside India, have, have gotten uh, any number of, um, let's say, initiatives by smaller groups which are trying to work around the system and, and try trying to kind of give a relief. I will end with an example. Uh, yesterday, um, I was part of a sort of a, a inter online meeting um, of citizens uh, of, uh, you know, a meeting called by the Bangalore Municipal Council, the BBMP. And so they were trying to probably learn from the Mumbai model and to divide. Uh, uh, Bangalore is 198 wards. So they were trying to have a ward wise handling of covid cases uh, like how um, uh, you know iqbal chahal in, in his interview to shekhar gupta uh, has has mentioned that rather than a 10000 case load across mumbai when each of these actually you know uh, he created a system where the patient's report of whether covid positive or not doesn't reach the patient directly but first comes into the control room and each of these wards then sort of split it amongst themselves. And then the doctors go to those particular addresses, examine the patients, and then decide which uh, hospital bed and whether they are asymptomatic and this thing, which, uh, you know, which kind of um, de-stresses uh, the hospitals from, from these loads. Likewise, in Bangalore, that there is right now uh, an attempt going on. Uh, I have said this in many other fora before that I don't know if there are any as number of activists per square kilometer in any other city as much as uh, in, in my hometown of Bangalore. But for me, uh, even amidst all the gloom and despair of you know, losing our, our uh, so many of our citizens, 
I was listening in uh, on that conversation. There was one lady, for instance, who's, uh, who asked the, um, you know, the government officer saying that, sir, there is this control room number that you, that, uh, you know, you have uh, given out. But please remember that this is the same number, which is also for victims of domestic violence and child sex abuse. And so um, the officer there, Mr. Manoj, he said that, uh, yeah, he, uh, yes, I'm, I'm aware, but at the same time, I'm sorry, madam, but this focus is on COVID to which this uh, uh, lady, uh, Brinda Adige, an activist who said that, yes, but please, this is related to COVID. The fact that people are having to be locked down in this space is what is increasing the number of cases of DV, right. domestic violence or uh, child sex abuse. So you have to uh, treat this also as a related case. And, and um, you know, because we can't um, opt out of one, it's just as much as a serious problem as, as uh, the other is. And so there were there, this whole attempt over those 60, 65 minutes that I saw of people trying to put so genuinely their points, put their feedback about nodal officers, what's not working, and in a manner which was not politicking, which was not, uh, let's say, um, uh, community targeting, uh, like how the leaders did. But in such a constructive manner, and then when, when there was a time when said that, okay, who are the volunteers who would like to please come forward? And there were so many people raising their hands and said that, please train us just so that we also become frontline warriors. So a lot of these good things have also emerged. Um, I think uh, Devi Shetty, the doctor, uh, has, has always made a case about paying doctors and nurses better so that we have so many more of them in the system. We have seen uh, cases where government doctors are paid as low as uh, you know, the interns particularly, uh, about 11,000 per, per month for the kind of work that they put in almost virtually 24-7 in these rooms. And so what's happening in many of these places, um, including uh, some of the early days in Bangalore, uh, when we lost a friend's wife, was that she was in the COVID uh, room, uh, you know, in, in the isolation ward, which, which, by the way, was is next to the mortuary. Uh, um, and, you know, the families, of course, had no access, but um, the sheer, you know, uh, the lack of or, or the sheer shortage of staff meant that when they actually managed to get through to a video call, uh, this gentleman to his wife, she was groaning not out of pain, but out of hunger because she had not been given her uh, meal that day, you know, and, and uh, so, so she was she was a bank officer in, in her days. She, was, she had just retired from service. And uh, this gentleman actually broke down when, when uh, you know, when I uh, called to pay my condolences, saying that this, you know, you just have to go to a COVID ward or, or at least outside the COVID ward because uh, you can't get to enter that. He said, Vasanthi, it's almost like these people who have been affected with COVID are no longer citizens of India. They are they're second class citizens. They have lost their uh, right to dignity. They have lost, um, you know, their, their right to information. They're, they're, you know, patients don't. It's, it's almost like a black hole, Maya. You don't get to know what line of treatment is being given. There's a, there's a shortage of drugs. Um, and and um, I know about two days back, way into midnight, we were trying for a drug for a friend who had been prescribed, only to be told that private pharmacies now no longer st stock it. And it has to be requisitioned straight from the pharma company. So my point at the end is this, saying that there has been negligence. There has been complete lack of focus. And I think enough has been said. I'm not going to go into uh, all that. Um, uh, everybody knows who's to blame. But I'm saying, that why can't the governments uh, really get at least now their act in order? Why can't there be simple, clear communication? We are seeing evidence of those who have recovered from COVID, discharged to get home, collapse within the second or third day at home. And these are recovered patients. In fact, a journalist in Delhi, she was just 53. One, one who was otherwise healthy. It's just that, you know, she had a post-COVID heart attack, uh, uh, cardiac arrest. And when I discussed this with the doctor, he said that, well, you know, it is true that uh, a cardiologist care is, is important. I said, I, as a journalist, had no clue about this. Yeah. How do we expect families to know about it? Why can't there just be a protocol uh, amidst all the technology and whatever you want to uh, uh, what you have to kind of put in place, uh, but also have simple, clear communication. Uh, there are some some 10 to 15 calls a day from, from the local municipal corporation. Now, you know, once a patient is diagnosed as COVID uh, positive, but it's, it's clearly not saying what needs to be said. 
which is that even post covid there need there seems they you need hand holding right so right now the system is equipped um for only those who are probably pushed into a situation where you have the covid care centers where way too many people then you have the critical mass which which are uh, clearly a minority i agree i mean uh, there are eight, there's an 80% recovery rate as as far as i uh, read the data last but i'm saying even for those who come out thankfully victorious after that stage of almost a death door we don't know how many people we are losing to covid because right. there is no data and since they have been now declared covid free they will not even come under the covid net so forget about medical um, help uh, there is going to they, they will not even be part of the statistics so which means they're going to be left out of this huge uh, even if there's a welfare scheme drawn uh, this is is something which is going to be left out so i am saying that i am in fact using your program to kind of call for action for those in the policy space those who are in the medical listing space to please focus as much on post covid patients as much as during covid Right. because we have seen and that's not no study is being done as to how many people we are we are losing and you know the lungs are so severely compromised there is such exhaustion there is loss of work days but worse there is loss of life who is to account for that and why why should we pay the why should we lose people like my friend who who just died waiting for an oxygen bed uh, who was otherwise in great health at 61 right. who was so productive who is to you know there is just no those questions are not uh, there's just just no one to answer them at the moment all right wasn't it it's a uh, it's a depressing note but it's an important note to end it on i want to thank you for your time uh, it's as always a pleasure to talk to you thank you mayank and it's a it's an important conversation um, and you know at the risk of seeming uh, as if the uh, the scenario in india as if it's so hope um, less you know as as if it's zero hope no that's not the case that there are good things but i think it's important to speak about those where where there is no hope at the moment and to in the uh, in the whole this thing that it, it will get better Indeed. so here is to here is to that scenario um, uh, that that we you know wo subah kabhi to aayegi yeah <laughs> all right Thank you. I'll let you go. I know it's getting late for you. Thanks a lot, and my best to your mother. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye.